been together for 10 years. You know, growing up with my dad as a minister and living together, you know, is probably not the right Even if the first group isn't the right group, keep trying because the bonds that you form and the support, the accountability that's held. You know, in our group, we've laughed together, we've cried together, we've rejoiced together, we've celebrated together. And it's nice to know that there's somebody at the other end of the phone that I can either text or pick up the phone at any time whenever we need anything. You cannot check, check, spend check. enough money to buy the love that we had at our wedding. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah. Having the support of our group, it was, it was the best wedding ever. Check, check, check. Now we're coming up on two year anniversary. <laughs> to sing some songs and just uh, really get into the spirit. Help us. Let's just get into the spirit. Let's just sing. Let's just worship God here together. Let's put our hands together. And we sing. Glorious Shout it out in glory Make it louder, Jesus, we shout your name, Jesus, we make your praise glorious, you are glorious. Lord is 
We love for you, Lord. Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one we could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Worthy of all 
It's just amazing to just have his presence, to feel that security in Jesus and what his son, Lord Jesus, has done.
child of God. Want to sing this with us? I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer I'm a child of God. Let's pray. us down. You stay the same. And that's what we want to do. We want to build our lives for you. We come before you to this altar, Lord. Confused, scared, sometimes ashamed. But Lord, we know that you forgive us. And that we continue to come before you, seeking more, seeking your truth that love and that presence that fills us is the only thing in this world that fills us that could be fulfilled it is your love thank you Jesus amen you may be seated amen well good morning and uh, welcome to faith we are so glad you are with us today and uh, it is the last Sunday of August before the fall, and uh, I hope you are craving pumpkin spice as much as I am. I love the fall time, and everything turns to pumpkin spice. It's exciting. But uh, today is a day I'm really excited about, and before I talk about why I'm excited, I just want to give a shout out to you who are new with us. If you are new with us today, or maybe last week was your first time, welcome. We're so glad that you're here today, and uh, uh, if I haven't mentioned yet, my name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. And, and in just a moment, we're going to take up our offering. And so to, to those of you who call this place home and you're here, this is an opportunity for us to not just worship through singing, but also worship through our tithes and our offerings and, and giving back to God what really is, is all his anyway. That's what we believe. And so uh, in a moment, we invite you to give back to God and to give towards the mission of this church, which is to love and lead people into a growing faith in Jesus. But if you are new with us today, we don't ask, we, we don't want your money. But what we'd ask for you is that you fill out a connect card, which is in the back of the chair in front of you. And if you pull that out, um, just fill out a few things about yourself on that and let us know a bit about who you are so that we can follow up with you this week. And uh, that'll be um, just, you know, maybe you'll get a phone call, maybe an email. We promise we won't harass you more than that. But uh, it's a good way for us to be able to follow up with you. Another thing we do here is uh, we check in on Facebook. And so everybody, if you want to right now pull out your phones, yeah, we're, we're asking you to pull out your phones in church. This is exciting. So go to the Facebook app, and in the top right, there's a button that says check in. And if you click on that, Faith Church should pop up. You can check in on Facebook. And what we do is every month we partner with a different organization uh, to provide real world good in the in, real good in the world, and this month every six check ins provides a brick to a school um, to help build a school. And so um, I think we've so far raised a total of like seventy bricks, which is incredible. You know, it's, it's it doesn't seem like much, but it takes a lot to make bricks in these countries. And last month I want to highlight last month because I think it's more exciting. In the month of July, we were able to uh, raise. 400 weeks of water for people in Haiti. And so that's pretty incredible. So it might not feel like like your single check-in does a whole lot, but it really does. And so we invite you to check in on Facebook. Include the hashtag bricks for schools to let your friends and family know why you're checking in. So there's that. All right. 
Now the big news, and the thing I'm so excited about for today, it's my baby because I'm the small group's pastor, and I've been praying for this event. Today's group link, and as you saw at the beginning of the service, um, that was Rich and Roseanne's story. They've been in the small group at Faith here with some of you who are maybe in this room. And uh, what they experienced through their small group is what I pray that you'll experience through your small group in, in your own way. And really, the purpose of small groups is that you would find a people who you would be able to find authentic community and spiritual growth with. And so if if that's something that interests you, if you're thinking in your brain, you know, that might be something I want to do, but I don't really know if I could fit in my schedule. You know, maybe I'll think about it in like November. No, I'm sorry. Today's the day. Today's the day to think about it because uh, you could wait till November, but by November, a lot of groups will have already been meeting, and you'll be coming in late. So today is group link, and it's happening right after the service at 12.30 p.m. Lunch is provided. Um, child care is provided if you need it. And uh, what basically you'll do is it'll be one hour, and you'll connect with other people in your stage of life or age bracket and form a small group that will meet for six to eight weeks and try it out. See how it goes. If after the six to eight weeks, you're like, yeah, I don't know if that was the right group for me, that's okay. We can start over. But Try it out. I encourage you. So that is today. Um, you could sign up if you want, but, you know, I'm not even going to check my emails before it. So just show up, and uh, it'll be right out that way. We'll have some volunteers pointing you in the right direction. It's going to be up in our chapel. So I'm super excited. Thank you, everybody, for being here. The fact that this service is more packed shows me you're all going to come to Group Link. So uh, you, you wanted to come to the 11 to come to Group Link. So thanks for being here. Awesome. Well, uh, Ushers, you can come forward at this point, and uh, we're going to take up our offering for the morning. And uh, we invite you, as I said, to give towards our mission and give towards what we're doing here at Faith Church. As they're doing that, I want to make you aware of some other options of giving. Um, you know, I don't usually carry cash or check on me. And so uh, if the bags go by and you, you know, just have to pass it by, no one's judging you for that. But what you could do instead is you could... Um, give online. And so what we have is is through PushPay, you can text the word Faith Auburn, all one word, to uh, 77977. So text Faith Auburn to 77977, and you'll get a link that'll text back to you, and just click on that link, and it's pretty easy. Or you can go to faithauburn.org slash give, and you can set up online, uh, monthly, recurring, weekly, recurring, whatever works for you and and what you feel you're, you're doing with God. So I invite you to give online if that's more convenient and easier for you, and it's completely safe and secure. So, all right. Today we are almost done with our series. We got next week as our last week, but we're in this series called Thrive, talking about how we can live a life where we don't have to have to just survive, but we can truly thrive. And today, uh, Pastor Doug's talking to us about time management. So without further ado, let's check out this video. Good morning, everyone. It is so good to be with you this morning. I am so excited about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I want to talk to you about something that is your most precious resource of all. Uh, It's non-refundable, non-replenishing. It is irreplaceable. Once you spend it, you'll never get it back. Time. All throughout the Bible, Scripture after Scripture, there are just so many Scriptures that speak to the brevity of life. I mean, if you look through the Old Testament, New Testament, you know, Psalms, Proverbs, the book of Job, um, on into the New Testament, I mean, just passage after passage that speaks to the fact that this life that we live, we live it once, and you never get back the time that you've spent or even wasted uh, and, and everything in the Bible and everything in life kind of proves that out, doesn't it? I mean, we have watches, right? You got your Fitbits. I got my Fitbit, you know, maybe your Apple Watch. Uh, maybe your phone tells you what time it is. Uh, clocks were created to tell you 
how brief life is. That's essentially what it is. You know, I, I, if you don't believe me, I have, a, I have a clock that guides me every Sunday morning. Everybody turn around, look back, see up there on the big screen in the back, 33 minutes and 42 seconds. And once it goes to red, there's this big trap door that opens up underneath of me. <laughs> Uh, th- we had this heirloom in our family. I'm going to show you a picture of it here, actually, a video. This is our heirloom. This is my grandmother's cuckoo clock, and it's from the 1940s, and it hadn't been working for a couple decades, and it passed on to my mom and then to me, and I w- I've been trying to get it working, and finally I just said, okay, I'm taking it to a clock dealer worker on it, and he, he put a new set of guts inside of it and got the thing working, and so for the last week or so, it's been hanging on my wall right out, right in our living room, right outside our bedroom door. Tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock. Reminding me with every tick, every talk, life is draining away. Life is, is go, you know, it's just ebbing away all day long. Tick, tock, tick, tock. And not only all day long, all night long as well, and it's not just the ticking and the talking. <laughs> yeah. So if I'm looking a little blurry-eyed and bloodshot, you'll know the reason why. Life ticks and talks away, doesn't it? I made the mistake this week of going on um, www.deathclock.com. You ever go on that? You can plug in your information, your birth date, and, you know, your health and everything else, and I have found that my day of departure is Friday, September 29th, 2034. I have 17 more years. That was scary to me. <laughs> and not only that, but they showed me the seconds too, like 9 million, or 5 million, 539 million, 512, 946,000, just going away. So now that you're thoroughly depressed, right? That's what you come to church for, right? (laughs) Just telling it like it is, folks. Time. It's brief. You got but one life to live. The question for us today, so critical, is not what time is it, but what am I doing with my time? Am I living it productively? Am I being successful in my time management Am I doing it in the way God wants me to do it? And I don't know about you, but, but that's a critical question for me. Because I think, if I think about it soberly, I think of the many times that I've not done that. Now, we're in this series called Thrive. And, and we've, we've established the fact that there are three primary relationships that you have to be, you have to be concerned about. If you are a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, you have to be concerned and attend to these three relationships, your relationship with God, your relationship with God's people, and your relationship with the world. Intimacy, involvement, that's why we do group link, that's why that's going on today, and influence in the world. This is going to be the outline for the next year. In fact, we're going to spend most of the fall just right there stuck on intimacy with God and trying to find ways to build that intimacy with Him and experiencing that presence, the presence, the manifest presence of the Lord in our lives. But if you're going to do it, and you're going to grow in these three areas, we said there are three things that you're going to have to steward. Remember that word? Steward, manage, administrate. You're going to have to steward your talents, your time, your treasures. Talents we looked at last week, and we said it this way. This is kind of our big point. We say, we, you know, I am a uniquely designed person for a uniquely designated place. It means you have gifts and abilities given to you by God, <laughs> these grace gifts. I mean, it's just so cool. It's Christmas. There's a package under the tree from God for you. Not only does he want, not only is he given you those gifts, he's got a spot for you to serve whether it's in the body of Christ or beyond, you have been blessed by God with talents. And how you steward them is going to either be a detriment to those relationships, those three relationships, or it's going to help. So today, the next area, you're going to be a good steward of your time. And I don't know many good people who do this. I mean, people who really get this right. 
I want to look to a person today who I think was the best time manager who's ever lived. Not talking about Benjamin Franklin, you know, um, the early bird catches the worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. No, he didn't say that part. Just think about it for a moment, yeah. Um, not Benjamin Franklin, not Stephen Covey, right? Effective things for highly effective people. No, 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 not Stephen Covey. Not Bill Gates, not Warren Buffett. Followers of Jesus, we have to look to Jesus. Jesus, for us, is the master of time. He lived his life so appropriately and so well, and we have to seek to not just imitate his character, and imitate his, his uh, desires, but we have to imitate the way in which he managed his life. And we're going to look at an incident today. Now, I, I just got to bring it home here. This is so critical for whatever time period you're in, whatever stage of life you're in. If you're a college person, maybe some of you are a freshman, you're going off to college in just a couple of weeks, yeah, yeah, it's, it's going to be all about time management, isn't it, right? Um, maybe you're retired. You know, and it's easy in retirement to just kind of let the, the moments just slip away. You've got to think, wherever stage of life you're in, you've got to think about time and how you're going to manage it for God. Now, I, I just want to give a little bit of confession here. Do as I say, not as I do. Of all of my flaws, and I do have many flaws, I'd say this is one of my top ones. I have not done this well throughout my life. And how I have lived my life, how I've spent my time. I will tell you this, that I think that I have used my time in such a way throughout the years that have not only threatened my marriage, but threatened my family as well. You see, we pastors, yeah, some of you who know pastors, maybe personally, you know that we don't do it too well. Uh, we, we work for the church, and we spend our time there, and we sacrifice other areas. All that to say this, you got to understand, you got to really listen here, because if you don't get this right, it will cost you. You will sacrifice in certain areas, and the cost will be too great. So this is critical. We need to pay attention to the example of Jesus. If you have your Bibles, turn with me. John chapter 7, we're looking at, again, an incident from the life of Jesus, and now there are many places I could have turned to in the Gospels to look at how Jesus organized and scheduled his life. But I've chosen this one because there's just so much in it. Jesus specifically talks about time here in this passage. So uh, we're just going to dive in. All right, here we are. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. Galilee is to the north, northern Israel. He's spending his time going around in Galilee because he did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders there, we're looking for a way to kill him. Jesus is smart. He understands. Now's not the time to go south in the area of Jerusalem. That time will come, but now's not the time. The time is now to minister in the region of Galilee. Have you ever looked at the Gospels and looked how very intentional Jesus lived his life? For so many of us, the shortest distance between two points is a zigzag line, right? You know, we're just bouncing to and fro, and we live these frenzied, harried, hurried lives. Jesus was always on time and never late. He was always methodical, purposeful, intentional with his life. And if you are going to try to be more like Jesus, you've got to listen to this and really pay strict attention to the fact how Jesus so purposefully lived his life. That's going to be the key, truly. In your relationship with God, God's people in the world, this is going to be key for you as you kind of uh, work out all the details of your life and the schedule, the calendar of your life. Now, that, again, let's go further with this incident, this situation. Now, the Jews' Feast of Booths. Well, let's stop for a moment. The Feast of Booths. Three times a year, the Jewish people were commanded in the Old Testament, to go up to Jerusalem and celebrate three primary feasts. This is one of them, the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. The word Hebrew in Hebrew is Sukkoth. It was uh, towards the end of August, the beginning of September, which was for them, like for us, it was the end of the harvest. So that's 
kind of what it celebrated, but it also celebrated the Israelites traveling through the wilderness in the Old Testament. Remember the Exodus? This was the feast that they celebrated the Exodus. And you know how they celebrated it? All the Jewish people would come and surround Jerusalem. And outside Jerusalem, they would build huts. Um, huts made of grass and, you know, just these temporary huts kind of symbolizing their temporariness through the wilderness and traveling. Hey, hey, you guys who like tenting, this is for you. This is it right here. This isn't for our family. You know, we used to camp at Camp Ramada, uh, but, you know, this, this is the Feast of Booze. And so this is near, very near. And it was at hand, and his brothers said to him, the brothers let me, think, let me remember the names here. Matthew 13 actually gives us the names. Four brothers at least. Do you know that? Do you realize? Jesus had four brothers. Half brothers, obviously. There was James and Joseph. Remember, Joseph is the father. Must be namesake, Joseph. And then Simon and Judas. Not Iscariot, but Judas. Very popular name during the day. So those are the four brothers. They come to Jesus. And here's what they say. Leave here. Leave here, Jesus, and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. I mean, duh, right? If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Now, I don't know about you, but when I first read that, you know, many, many, many years ago, that, that stumped me. Because I was thinking, wait, wait, wait a second. They believe that he can do miracles. And in fact, they're so, they're, so, uh, they're so good with that, so all right with that, that they want him to go and really show the crowds. Back in John chapter 6, some of the crowds fell away. They're probably saying, hey, you got you to gotta do something here, Jesus, to win back the crowds, you know, walk across a few swimming pools, do a few, uh, you know, multiplying the loaves and the fishes thing again. I mean, y you need to draw in the crowds again, Jesus. And, and I would expect the writer, the gospel writer, John, to say, they said this because they believed in him. John doesn't say that. John says, they don't believe. Isn't it interesting? There are two kinds of unbelief in this passage. The first kind is the kind that we often come across, the very resistant kind. They're the Jewish leaders who are trying to kill Jesus. We meet people like that all the day. I'm not literally trying to kill Jesus, but they're just resistant, kind of uh, stubborn, malevolent unbelievers and, you know, hogwash to all this uh, Christianity stuff and hogwash to all of you Christians and maybe you've met a few. But this is a different variety, isn't it, right here? This is a kind of person who may even call themselves Christian, but have a different agenda. An agenda that's not God's agenda. What you're going to see here in this passage is that there are very clearly two agendas to live by with your life. Two standards, two ways of looking at things, two perspective views, and, 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 and whichever one you choose is going to be critical for you. They have chosen, wrongly, falsely, they have chosen a worldly view, a kind of a worldly agenda, which kind of says this, you know, Jesus, you got to get out there in front. You've got to get out there in front of this problem. After all, you've lost some disciples along the way. Your fame is at stake here. Because after all, if you are the Messiah, and your call is to kick these dirty, rotten Romans to the curb, and we're behind you on that all the way, then you've got to take strides to getting ahead of this thing. You've got to raise your stock, Jesus. And I wonder, I just wonder this. I wonder if their motive was a little selfish in this. Because if they see Jesus' stock going up, maybe their stock will go up. Hmm, what do you suppose? You know, we're the brothers. I mean, if you're going to be the CEO, the president of everything, Jesus, Messiah, then maybe there's a spot for us as the general somewhere, somewhere in the uh, pecking order. We don't know. But all John says is, they were unbelievers. They had their own agenda. They didn't see time 
the way Jesus saw time. And here's what he says. This is a powerful, powerful verse. Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come. Wow. Ever hear anybody say that? Mm. But your time is always here. (laughs) The word there, uh, some translations actually say, and I think it's right, your time is always opportune. In other words, you can go up to the festival whenever you want. You can literally do anything you want. You know, it's as if Jesus is saying, you know, you're not believers. We live under this free will thing. The fact that God gives us freedom to do what we want to do, to use our time any way we want to use our time. You're living under that strategy. You can do whatever you want. And it's going to hurt you in the end. It may not be beneficial or productive, but, but you can do whatever you want. As for me, my time has not yet come. Now, now this word, time, is so cool, such a cool word in the Greek. There's two words for time in the Greek. One is chronos, where we get the word chronology from, or chronometer, right, chronometer. It, it, it marks off time. In other words, that, that word time, chronos time, is quantitative time. It's, it's ticking off the minutes, the seconds. But there's another word for time, and it's the one here. It's kairos time, which is opportunity or opportunistic, purposeful time. In other words, Jesus is saying, but my purposeful time, my meaningful time has not yet come. What's his meaningful time? Why was Jesus born? He was born to die. But that hasn't come yet. And and the time is not yet ready for that. In fact, there are many times in the Gospel of John where Jesus says almost exactly the same thing here. The first is back in John chapter 2. And and again, you know how I said there's there's a lot of times in the the Gospels and the Scriptures that I think are kind of a little humorous. And this is one of them. Jesus is there at the wedding feast of Cana at Galilee. And, oh, Oh, no, the reputation of this couple, the, the, the married couple, they've run out of wine. Oh, no, their reputation is at stake. And what happens? Jesus' mother, Mary, because that's what mamas do, right? You know, they go, hey, Jesus, you could do something about this situation. I know you could. I mean, think about the couple, right? That's what you mamas do, right? Come on. And, and what, is, what does Jesus say? I can almost see him saying it with a big smile on his face. Woman, my hour has not yet come. <laughs> what, he's saying, this isn't the right time for me to get public yet. I, I can't get out there so quickly out into the public eye. It's not yet to come. Later on, at the end of the Gospels, this cool thing happened. These, these uh, Greek Gentiles come uh, looking for Jesus, and they come to a couple of disciples, uh, Andrew uh, and um, uh, uh, Philip, and uh, they said, we, sir, we would like to see Jesus. And when it's reported to Jesus that these Gentiles, these Greeks, not Jews, these non-Jews are seeking out Jesus, what does he say? My hour has come. And in other words, the time for getting the message out to the world is, is very much upon us. And, and we're right at the moment. My hour has come. But at this point, not right now. Time's not yet. Uh, time's not yet right. So in other words, here's the, here's the point. There's two perspectives. There's a worldly agenda, and there's an eternal object, uh, agenda. Uh, Spinoza, the ph- philosopher, called it uh, subspecie aeternitis. Sounds like a disease, doesn't it? He said it. It means from the perspective of eternity. Th- that, that's how we need to live our lives, from the perspective of eternity. In other words, what's the end goal? Do you live your lives for eternity? Looking forward, do you, do you have that sense that this is who I am under God and for God, and I live my life, all of my minutes and hours are spent living for Him, and I'm listening to Him. I'm on board with His agenda, not the world's agenda. Hey, that's huge. We go on. He goes on to say, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You know, Jesus is kind of telling the truth about where we're all at. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He's, he's telling us all the truth, but there's, there's hope, isn't there? 
you go up to the feast. Go ahead. doesn't matter. I am not going up to this feast for my time has not yet fully come. And actually, there's a word in, 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 uh, in, in some of the translations and manuscripts, it's actually not here in this one. I am not yet going up. We're going to see from the next verse, Jesus had every intention going up to the feast, just not in the way they wanted him to go. You understand that? See how, see how critical this is? Like Jesus is going up to the feast because it's important for him to be there, but he is not going up to win over an audience, to gain fame, popularity, to be the superhero. He's going there with the mission of God in mind. Next verse. After he said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. And, and eventually what happens, we find him not doing the mir mighty miracles. What is he doing? He's teaching. He's educating. He's, he's prophesying. He's trying to grow people in their faith and understanding of God and who he is. See? How do you live your life? You know, you know we say your checkbook we're going to talk about this next week, but your checkbook kind of proves your commitment, doesn't it? Your faith in God. Your, your, your financial statements kind of tells you a little bit about your faith. Do you know that your calendar also tells you about what you believe and who you are living for? You know, if God were here right now, and he was going to call us off into the room, you know, having a little sit-down meeting with each one of us, and he'd say, okay, open up your schedule, let me look at it. What would he see? Would he see a calendar that is devoted to him, that has heavenly priorities or worldly priorities, worldly agenda? See what I mean? This is so critical for us to understand. And one of my favorite verses in the book of Ephesians kind of says it so well. It just crystallizes everything that Jesus is showing to us. Here's what Paul says to the Ephesians. Look carefully then how you walk. The word there carefully means not carelessly, carelessly stumbling along like through the dark. We certainly live in very dark times. Look carefully. Be careful how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. This is what's so cool here. Making the best use of time. The word here literally, literally, literally is redeem the time. I love that. What do you do when you take your bottles down to the redemption center? They buy them back from you, right? And you purchase the bottles, but they're now buying them back from you. Who are you, Christian? You're a child of God, but you've been redeemed, meaning Jesus has bought you back out of your sinful life. He has purchased you. And your responsibility now, again, isn't this cool? Am I the only one thinking this is cool? <laughs> you are called to redeem, buy back the time. Why? Because the days are evil. I don't know about you. Everything in the scriptures tell me that the days are going to get more evil, more evil, more evil, worse and worse and worse. It's not like we have some good days and bad days. It's not like some days we're up and some days we're down. Paul just says, because the days, all of them are evil, so buy back the moments. Buy back the hours, the times. You are the salt and life light of the world. Get in there and take it back for good. Well, that's kind of what you kind of see Paul extrapolating here, right? Oh, therefore, do not be foolish. But what, understand what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? So I think it's this. If I could just kind of boil it down. Instead of just managing your time, leverage your life. Managing is all about the to-dos and the to-don'ts, right? You know, you, you look at all the obligations, and you make sure that you leave enough time, and you plug time, or you plug the events into the, the time, the days, and it's about kind of, you know, slicing off your day, managing, it's, it's being disciplined and, and, and being effective, not to waste time. But leveraging is different. Leveraging means I'm going to take into account what is the most important in my life. 
I'm going to prayerfully look to see what are the essentials. You see, you need to have a to-do list. And you need to have a to-don't list. You need to have a honey-do and a honey-don't list. Guys, you can thank me later after that, right? There are things that should be on your plate and things that should not be on your plate. But here's the problem in America, right? We idolize busyness. The busier we are, you know, the more effective or even perhaps the holier we are. As long as we look busy, 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 busy. And let me tell you, if Satan can't make you bad, he will make you what? Busy. Just as busy, busy, busy as you can be. So, so priority number one here, if we got to leverage our life, priority number one is you need to schedule your values. First of all, you need to determine what those values are. What is it? Time with God? Time with my spouse? Time with my children? Yes, time at work. Ho-hum. Yeah, I got to do that too. Time with God's people, group link, spending time with with fellow believers where we can encourage one another and grow one another in our faith before God. Yeah, all those things. And those are the priorities of my life. You know the old adage, God will never give you more than you can handle. You know how that goes? You've heard it before, right? I'm not sure that that's legitimate or true, but I know it is true. God will never give you more than you can accomplish. You know, he is not that dictatorial, dictatorial ruler in your life, cracking the whip, saying, more, more, more. He's the heavenly father who says, this is what's on your plate. Why is it you want to put more on your plate? That's not of me. That's of you. Get it off. I'm not calling you to do those things. Let somebody else empower someone else to do those things. This is what's on your plate. You're not a slave. You're a child of God. And he's graciously saying to you, you have 24 hours the same as everybody else. And your level of ability is this much. And I don't want you to do more because you're going to burn out. You're not going to be effective for anyone then. So you and I prayerfully have to come before the Heavenly Father and say, okay, God, what's on my plate? Think about it like a mariner, right? Think about it like you were out on the high seas. And uh, you had to get to a certain point. So you, you, you left point, port A to get to port, port B. What do you do? You need quality maps. You need charts. You need, you need your, uh, all of your... Uh, essentials there, all of the, you know, your compass and all the other tools that you have and that they're rightly calibrated and you chart a course for yourself. Back in 1879, uh, a captain by the name of Lieutenant George DeLong uh, left for the North Pole. 1879, to be the first to ever get to the, uh, the North Pole in the USS, I think it was the USS Jessica. Uh, and they had this map uh, that, that kind of showed the North Pole, ice all around it, but then right in the middle where the North Pole was, there was this Caribbean-like area. <laughs> yeah, literally, teeming with life. I kid you not. They had a map that, that, that showed that this, this uh, circle, you know, hundreds of miles was just this warm, tropical-like atmosphere. And once you crush through the ice... Once you broke that barrier, you got into open sailing and everything would be fine. Not so much, right? (laughs) It didn't happen that way. I mean, they they found miles upon miles, hundreds of miles of ice. And guess what? Yes, they all died. Because they had really bad maps. Some of us, some of us are using the maps of the world. And we're using the strategy The agenda, we're living by the agenda of the world and we're thinking that, you know, the world needs to tell us what to do and we find it very hard to say no. But that's actually a very godly thing. This is what Louis Giglio, you know, so many of us love Louis Giglio. This is what he says. Whenever you say yes to anything, there is less of you for something else. Make sure your yes is worth the less. Prayerfully look at this. Determine what are the priorities, the main priorities of my life. As you go forward this year, this is a daily 
thing you need to do, a, a weekly thing. You need to continually recalibrate and get back to the priorities of your life. Don't let your life turn into a zigzag. Secondly, uh, create deadlines, artificial deadlines. Y- you know what? You, some of us need to work faster because we, when we work faster, we work better. In other words, it's so easy, at least for me anyhow, it's so easy to waste time. For instance, I have a drop-dead date Thursday at 5 p.m. every single week that my sermon is done. Now, now sometimes there are, there's a little bit of tweaking that goes on. Often there is a lot of tweaking that goes on. But I really try hard because my day off is Friday. And I don't want all day Friday to be kind of the sermon percolating. And before you know it, it's not really a day of rest. See, so, so some of us need to kind of create, the, what do you call it? The vacation principle, right? Vacation principle. If it's Friday at 5 o'clock and you're going on vacation, what do you do for the rest of the day? You get everything accomplished on that day and you determine what's the most important things for the day and you let the other things that aren't so important just kind of go by the wayside because you know at 5 o'clock you are out the door headed for vacation. Some of us need to kind of set up that artificial deadline to say, you know what, I'm going to spend three hours cleaning the garage. It'll take me 12, but I'm only going to take three hours now. Uh, I'm going to take this much time reading the book. I'm going to take 20 minutes playing a video game. Again, got to set up these deadlines. It's so critical to be effective in your life to do that. The most important thing is the last one here. And I think that, that, that we all need to work on this. Pause for refreshment. We're talking about Sabbath rest here. We're talking about a space in your life. We all need space. When you read a book... You need space, right? Can any of you read this? Okay, let's show it up there. How about it? Is this good? Can you read that okay? (laughs) I know this paragraph doesn't look right. It's because the pastor typed it out. (laughs) It's not because he's prone to making mistakes. Some would beg to differ with that. But... Because he wants to make a point. It's hard reading a paragraph without pauses and punctuations. It is the same in life. You need pauses and punctuations in order to not go crazy. You need margin. You're not equipped to work seven days a week, 365 days a year. Think about it like the mariner again. Again, you're, you know, you're this mariner out on the open seas. You've got a vessel with a certain capacity, right? We took a little bit of a Sabbath rest yesterday. We went to see friends up in Gloucester. And so we were there out on the jetty, the, uh, uh, the, the what is it? Not the dike. It's the break wall. It's the break wall. Friend, friends from Gloucester are here too today. So we're, we're there, we're there, and we're seeing these big schooners that are out at sea. And then we turn to the right, and we see the harbor and this sky and this little itsy-bitsy sunfish. You know those little sailboats? Because he knows you just don't take it out of the open sea. His boat doesn't have the capacity. you got to know what your capacity is. Some of you, your boats are taking on water. I'm just saying. You're doing too much and you're not taking that needed rest. The commanded rest from the scriptures, by the way. This is a grace gift from God, isn't it? That God gives you one day that is not like any other day to just completely rest. And guess what? In America, only 14% of all Americans actually take a day of rest. 14%. And of that 14%, only 17% of them actually take an entire day of rest. In other words, even on their day off, they will do some work on that day that they shouldn't be doing. So, So that means 3%. 3% of all Americans are actually taking a day of rest. And you know what happens? We're living on borrowed time. Our culture is getting burned out because we're working way too much and working way too hard, and God does not want it that way. He's giving you a day off. Now, what do you do with your day off? Well, you're doing it here. You're doing it now. It's good to be with God's people on your day off, isn't it? Just praising God. I tell you, 
I get lifted up. I just want, I can't even, I can't begin to tell you all things, major spiritual, supernatural God things that have happened today that, that the, the angels are rejoicing over. So, so you come together, be with God's people, right? But, but you get the chance to go from here and, and to take a deep breath. And for some of us, maybe we're going to play Frisbee with our kids. Um, maybe we're going to read a good book. Uh, you know, if the Patriots were on, that's mine, you know. I fall asleep. You know what? The godliest thing that I can do Sunday afternoons is taking a nap. And God says, I approve. That's what he wants for our lives. He wants that one day where we can just, just soak it in so that we're good for the rest of the week and we can work hard the rest of the week. So, so there are some critical things here that we need to pay attention to. Again, if we're going to be good, successful in our relationship with God, God's people, the world, we've got to consider this godly use of time operating on his agenda. I thank you so much for coming today. Let's stand for closing prayer. Our Father and our God, we're so grateful to, uh, to look to the life of Jesus. <laughs> he, is, he is the master of time. Not only did he create it, but he so wonderfully used it in a, in a God-honoring way. And Father, we just pray today that we could learn from him, that we could begin to kind of look at our lives in every single day as an opportunity to live for you, to leverage our lives for your sake, for your honor, and for your glory. We thank you so much, God. Thank you. Thank you for treating us not as slaves but as your beloved children. You want the very best for us. And so, God, we walk out of here, not with our heads hanging low, but, God, we walk out of here encouraged and strengthened by the fact that you love us and that you're looking out for our best interest. And so, God, we hope this week could be a little different on how we look at our lives and how we look at our calendars and our schedules. Thank you. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks. Thanks for coming today. God bless you. See you next week, Labor Day.